Hello, book two. Well, as you can I see, you. I have a guest. In fact, I, I have two. two. This is my old frenemy, Deb, and her adorable little dog. Care to introduce your little dog? This is Lucky. Mm. He's my little baby. <laughs> He's probably due for another haircut soon, but... And in a way, he could be called Steve's Revenge, couldn't he? How many years did I tease you for having tiny little dogs? How I know. Did I do that? And now and I have discovered the joy of tiny little dogs. I have discovered the joy of tiny little dogs. <laughs> he's a good boy. He's going to go do whatever he's going to go do. Now I'll move. So Sorry. I'm kind of wiggling. You're jiggling all around, Mrs. D. You... Yeah, no, I, I just had to wiggle closer to the computer. Because I'm outside, as you can see. Yes, you're at the family compound in Maine. Yes. 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 That you're not Where allowed to leave without your men folks' permission. Correct. Sorry. In written written form. Yes. It right. has to be on file. There are, I know this is going to blow your mind. It actually blows my mind as well. But there are thousands more people here than there were the last time you were on this show. Oh, seriously? So... I, for all of you who are new and are watching, this is Deb. She is an old, old friend of mine. And we are here to do Manatee Mondays. Yes, sir. Which we break down into three categories. My aches and pains, my stories, and my books. Because Deb and I are both, as we say in Boston, wicked pissa old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can remember the 70s mm -hmm. and the 60s. I can remember the some of the 60s. So my aches and pains is where we start off by giving you pointless anecdotes that go in endless circles, complaints about some minor gripe or physical ailment, <laughs> the way old people do. Do you want to kick yes. us off? Well, mine is, it, it's this good old standby allergies. Because now they're, they're in my ears. So I'm like a little bit dizzy. I, I feel like I got water in my ear, but I haven't been in the water, so it's not really water in my ear. So that's my aches and pains. It's just just I the didn't normal know you get allergies in your ears. Uh, well, well, because it swells your all all the sinus cavities in your face, and I assume that's what's bothering my ear. So does it affect your balance? Um. It makes me feel dizzy. I don't know that it affects my balance like, like, you know, like I teeter over, but, but I don't, but I feel off. I wouldn't want anything interfering with the Olympic level precision of your hand eye <laughs> coordination. I wouldn't want you to suddenly be teetering and wobbling whenever you move. I wouldn't want anything. To do it doesn't, it did affect my gymnast career, yes. <laughs> Well, my own ache and pain I'd be at the very... Olympics right now if it weren't for this. <laughs> Mine is every bit as trivial. Okay. I have a scab. <gasps> I have a scab on the top of my head. And you ever have one of those things where it bugs you? You know perfectly well that if you just leave it alone, it'll go away, but you can't. So you keep kicking at it. Mm -hmm. I have one of those. Yeah, it's hard so not I to. I have one of those. It's in part of the West Indies that I can't even reach anymore. But now it's on the top of my head. It's easily reachable. So anyway. <laughs> now what, did, what did you do? Do you know what you did to it? Oh, no. It, nothing at it all. It just it, appeared? It's, it's this annoying thing. You and I could probably do two hours on how annoying it is to get old. It's, it, it's this annoying thing where suddenly your skin is papery sensitive, where once upon a time... Yeah. You could take a hour or two it and it had no effect at all. Now it's papery sensitive all the time. You you brush against it and it's bright purple for the next three weeks. <laughs> well, I've always bruised really easily. So, um, yeah, I, I will have horrendous bruises and people are like, what'd you do? And I'm like, I have no idea. I, I brushed against something. 
I, I have no idea. I guess I forgot that because in our long years of working together, I only bruised you psychologically. <laughs> yes. Uh, not physically. <laughs> I never did it physically. <laughs> I, you you again, didn't need to. For the thousands of you who don't know what I'm talking about, Deb and I used to work in a bookstore in Boston together every day. Oh, my God. He harassed me. <laughs> Endlessly. <laughs> Crazily. Bosses would, bosses would take me aside and say, look, if, we, if you want me to intervene, <laughs> like I, I'm willing to have a word with him. And I'm like, no, he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As, as, and, and also, as I always say, new employees would, would get together. We used to have a break room up on the second floor, and there was a little mail room right next to it with an open door. And I think Deb was the only person in the building who said, you know, anything that you say in this room, he can easily hear you say from there. He could hear you from the street much less from this other room, but they never got that. So they would always talk about me the minute I was in the mail room instead of the break room. And I, one of them, one time, one of them said, well, he, he says that he makes fun of, the more he makes fun of someone, the better he likes them, but he never stops making fun of Dev. So <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I grew up with brothers. I can, I can take teasing. But I can take good hearted teasing. We're going to move on to perhaps a darker section. Oh. Of Manatee Monday, must stories. Must stories. Maybe it won't be so dark. Certainly, well, the whole country has remembered in the last week what it feels like to be hopeful. Yes. So maybe that's what you're feeling. What's your story this time around? Well, my story is how annoyed I am by the um, attacks against Kamala Harris that are based, that that are saying that she slept her way to the top. I, I find in the memes, I, I just want to unfriend everybody that uses that as a, as a thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, it's just sickening is what it is. Yeah. And especially when it's a woman that does it, I, I just want to, I just want to slap them and be like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, say what you want about the woman. Like, say what you want about, you know, her politics or her career. But don't attack her implying that she, that the only way she got where she is, is on her knees. Right. Like, that's just, right. and that's just disgusting. And keep in mind, that implication has a deeper layer, which is that that's how any woman gets where she is. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Utterly like, amazing. I mean, in the 70s that we both just talked about, maybe that was part of the landscape. Maybe Geraldine Ferraro had to put up with that. Doesn't it feel weird now? I mean, what is a, what a weird thing well, to even think about. And and there's also boiled into that is is the the racial. Um, I mean, I don't hear the same. I mean, like. Nobody said Hillary got where she was on her knees. Right. Right? I never heard that about Ferraro. No. No, I never did either. No, it feels and, really and so weird. I, You're right. It's probably a racial element. So I think it's I think it's I think it's a a combination of misogyny and racism that like nobody when Nikki Haley was running I didn't hear anyone say stuff indicating that that's how she got ahead I mean that's like true, isn't it huh that, that's true isn't it no one said that yeah no and it and it so and it, could it, in addition it, to a racial element could it be also a sense of threat I hope they're threatened by her I really hope they they see that she has a chance and you know, and, and you can, you know, you can say what you want about her politically. Um, but, you know, it, it, it just really gets on my last nerve. Well, my, my story is connected to yours. Uh-huh. Uh, but both of us are avoiding the, the big orange elephant in the room <laughs> i'm i am my mu my story deals with the the little baby elephant in the room jd vance jd vance oh my god who 
torpedoed any chance of anyone taking him seriously or liking him at all on either end of the aisle. When he made that comment, when that comment was on Earth of him talking to Tucker Carlson and saying, uh, talking about childless cat ladies. I know. You would think that anyone who made a comment like that would spend a good solid month distancing himself from it because it's not salvageable. Right. It can't help but hurt the ticket. What did he do today on CNN? He didn't just say that Kamala Harris was a childless cat lady. He said she was a child hater. Yeah, yeah. The house now, was turned. I want to make it clear. Her children. I want to make it clear to everyone children. out there. I have no children. And the reason I have no children is because I like children. And I knew that to have a child in my position in life would be utterly unfair to a child do you know what i mean i mean other than our children of course but well, keep them who keeps these things around but they, yeah they're just a money pit if you keep them around <laughs> but but i didn't want to have i mean i wanted children but i didn't want to have children because i knew that you know financially i'd be in a bad position to have children and you, can you lift your head up a bit? All I can see is, there we go. That's perfect. That's better. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. You know, it's it's my child, cat lady. You know, I can't sit up straight. <laughs> but what? Um, it, so now if you have adopted children, you hate children? What? Yeah. yeah. Who doesn't know someone who has an adopted child? What kind of a thing is that to double down on? And I guess Vance, I guess Vance's wife came out and said, Oh, he didn't mean people that want to have children and are trying to have children and can't. He just meant people that chose not to have them. He had an out. He could have said, well, that's an old clip. Tucker Carlson's yeah. not on the air anymore. It's an old clip. It's taken out of context. It's in the past. Look, I don't want to talk about the past. But he doubled down on it. I was making a joke and it was a bad one. Right. And, and I'm embarrassed now, by it. You now. adopt children. You hate children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and the idea that he's also doubled down on, I think, is that parents should have more votes than non-parents. Yeah, he said it a few times. Because, because the person as we there. know, as we know, the only reason you would care about the future is that you've reproduced. That's yeah. the only reason you care about other people. Otherwise, you don't have a stake in the country. Yeah, you have no stake in the future. Because I, I swear they don't understand empathy. Like how you can be like, yeah, I don't have children. I personally have no stake in the future. Yeah. But I want other people to be able to live and be happy and, you know, successful and have a decent life and a decent world. No, no. They don't understand empathy. They don't. They don't. I, don't did, I don't know if you saw the news from yesterday at Trump's Klan rally, the one Klan rally that he's bothered to have in a week. He just stops solid for 21 seconds, just staring solid for 21 seconds. And the, the media, the, the Twitter media jumped all over it as his brain glitching. But actually, it's worse. It wasn't his brain glitching. It was that someone passed out right in front of him. Oh, he didn't. He didn't say, hey, can we get some help? He didn't look concerned. He didn't look like yeah. he understood at all. He looked vaguely annoyed. Yeah. How long it was taking to cart this unconscious body off the stage. And I'm amazed that no, maybe someone has on, on social media yet, but there's an easy splice. Because just the other day, somebody passed out from the heat for uh, Tim Walz. And he did stop everything. And he did seem concerned. And he did say, hey, could you help them? He, I'm amazed he seems, this was them side by side. He seems like a really good guy. Yeah. Like, shit might come out about him, but right now. Yeah, he seems like a nice guy. Yeah. I wouldn't mind hanging out with him. No, I wouldn't either, provided I'm not a turkey. He likes to, oh. hurt, <laughs> he likes to shoot them with his gun and kill them. Uh, yeah. You know, when I'm looking at all the pictures of him hugging his dog and smiling, I'm kind of mentally cropping out the giant rifle. Oh, did you, did you hear, so uh, a friend of mine sent me a link about um, his dog and I thought, oh my God, it's going to be another uh, Christy Gnome. Is it Christy or Kirsty? I don't know. 
or, or um, Mitt Romney. It's going to be another moment like that. And so I opened the link and I read the story. And it was that because it was something about his dog getting locked in the bedroom. And I thought, Oh my God, he locked his dog in the bedroom. This is horrible. <laughs> and then I read the story and it's like the dog got locked in the bedroom because the dog, dog locked got himself in the bedroom in the <laughs> and, and can operate the doorknob, I guess, and somehow right. locked it. And they had to go get a ladder and go through the window. And like, it's just such a wholesome story. Yes. Yes. You Especially know? the final picture. Do you remember the final picture? They took a picture of the dog's face when the door was open and he's got the biggest crap eating grin on his face. He's so happy that all this trouble was gone to on my behalf. <laughs> that final and they changed, picture of the and dog's they changed face. the lock. They changed the doorknob so that it wouldn't automatically lock the way so the dog wouldn't get locked in again. And I thought, yeah, that's what normal people do. They don't take their dog out back and shoot them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's actually, I mean, I don't mean to reduce this to, to simplicity, but picture uh, the four candidates just sitting in a room. Of course, they would because the, the two MAGA candidates would literally try to murder their <laughs> other candidates. But it, it, picture that they did. Picture they were in a room and then suddenly a big, floofy, brain dead, happy yellow lab bounds into the room. Trump would start yelling at the people who were handling the outside perimeter. J.D. Vance would recoil, and the two normal people would, would oh, jump. and the dog the wouldn't go near either one of them. It's just... I don't know. I, so our, our stories are somewhat linked. Yeah. They're, all, they're, they're vaguely connected to J.D. Vance. But I, <laughs> I really, I, I, hope, I hope the Harris Waltz ticket keeps getting momentum. And that people register to vote and go out and vote. And so, before you know, we get to my books, how have my books summer been in Maine? I hate summer. I hate it with a passion. The only good thing about summer is the lake, and I haven't been to the lake, so I hate everything about summer. It's too hot. It's too humid. I, I don't take any pleasure in any outdoor sports or you know uh anything like that so it's been it's been gross and miserable and what did you ask me that was it <laughs> what, oh. the summer event in maine that was that was it oh, summer event. it's um today actually is not as bad as i thought it was going to be i thought it was going to be really hot and humid and it is a little humid but but there's a breeze so it's not horrible yeah, um here it's lovely hundreds of miles south in Boston. It's lovely. And, and you know, we've had some rain um, from, I guess, Hurricane Debbie. Yeah. Um, and it looks like bit, the next bit of that will bother us will be Hurricane Ernesto. Oh, see, I haven't heard anything about that yet. Hurricane, it was not named Hurricane yet, but the the, oh. the weather pattern that, that would become Ernesto, the next name is Ernesto, and the weather pattern that would become Ernesto looks strong enough. I think it will I think it will cohere into a, into a hurricane uh, and hit the Gulf Coast. So it'll, it'll start ripple patterns all the way up the eastern sea coast. We'll probably get something like that in a week. Uh, but anyway, what about books? How has the summer been for Deb's reading? I, I still have not been reading a lot. I, I got new glasses. Um, I got, uh, I asked specifically for, so these are the normal glasses, the progressive lens, um, and and they still weren't um, magnifying the page enough for me. So I got a pair of actual reading glasses with the prescription, you know, the uh, progressive prescription, but the whole lens. So I've been trying to get used to those because those are kind of weird because you can't look up like if you if you're looking at your book and then you look up it it uh you know your your belly flips you know because it's it's all of a sudden you're not you're looking at things out of focus oh really because your focus you, you know your lens are for the close-up reading oh, but right. then if you look up it's like 
you're spinning, you know? So the prescription reading glasses, you can't have those on and walk around the house. Correct. Okay. Correct. I can only use those when I'm actually looking at a book. So have um, you read anything that you liked this summer so far? So, so what I am reading um, is The Disaster Artist about the movie The Room. Are you familiar with the movie The Room? I am. I've never seen it, but I've seen clips of it and it and and I love bad movies. Like I love the kind of movies that are so bad they're entertaining. Um, um and so I'm enjoying reading about it because you know, someday I hope I get to see it. Is that a mo a book from the library? No, it's actually one I own. I still have to get my library card up here because I have to get my state ID first. To get a library card. You need to get a library card in Maine? Why can't you just use a piece of current mail? Uh, you have to have a picture ID. Oh, my. Yeah. And you also so, have relatively close by a retail bookstore? Yes, Sherman's. And I really am kind of impressed by them. They're, they're It's small. It's like the store itself is probably... Um, I'm trying to think of a store that you'd be familiar with that like maybe the maybe it's the size of the Brookline Booksmith without the gift add-on section right. the, the section where the gifts are um so it, it's relatively small but but I'm impressed by stuff that I go there looking for and they actually have it on the shelf like I go there thinking oh I'm gonna have to order this um like John Cotter's book I I thought, oh, I'm going to have to order this. But I walked in and it was on the shelf. Milkweed and editions. You'd think it probably wouldn't be at a bookstore. Is there a I didn't think, I, I, I didn't think it was, yeah, I didn't think that it was that big a um, book, you know, that big a release that, that a store, you know, having to um, limit its space would, would have, but they did have it and I was impressed. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I am impressed by them and it's a, you know, it's a little friendly store. Sherman's. Sherman's like, it's not a, it's not a Barnes and Noble type, you know, over the top corporate corporation, you know, where they're in your face about shit all the time. Um, and, and we say that because your viewers that may not know, that's where you and I used to work. This Back when there was a retail bookstore in Boston. Yeah, we worked at mm -hmm. Boston Noble in downtown Boston. And then we moved over to the Prudential Center. Yep. Yep. And and uh, it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. I worked there for a good number of years. And when we had good managers, it was, it was okay. Like yeah. early, you know, the first... I would say maybe 10 years I worked yeah. there were fine. Yeah. When the managers like, were allowed like to. It was stressful. It was stressful because we had to push the membership, but, but it wasn't like overwhelmingly like beating you down all the time, which it became. Yeah. 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 I often say I, when I, when I think about Barnes and Noble today, I often say that if you or I applied to a Barnes and Noble now, the only thing that would determine whether or not we got hired would be how willing we are to work in the cafe. We well, we wouldn't be hired because we're old. Well, yes, that we wouldn't be. Yes, it'd be, we wouldn't have it anyway. But there would be no questions about books. And if you said, well, I don't want to work in food service. I want to work in the bookstore. You'd be, oh, yeah. you'd be told, no, we can't use you with that. Well, as you, as you know, when new hires would come in and you'd ask them, what do you like to read? And they'd be like, oh, I don't really like to read. Or, oh, I read People magazine. It's like, <laughs> oh, then the bookstore, great. Great place for you. Yeah. Still, I'd like a retail bookstore to open in Boston. A general all-purpose retail bookstore. Barnes & Noble. I'd like a Barnes & Noble to open in Boston. So there's nothing right now? There's a, there's a retail bookstore, Beacon Hill, or Back Bay Books. Or, no, it's Beacon Hill Books. Right on the other side of Boston Common from uh, the Brattle. But they're very... It's they're a high end cafe with a bookstore attached. So 
So, so it's kind of like, um, what's the name of the one on Newberry Street that is the restaurant with a small Trident. It's Trident. what? Trident. The Trident. Okay, yeah. yeah. But only, only more judgmental. Okay. The type of retail bookstore, I get the impression, I've never been there, but I get the impression, like, for instance, this scandal that has enveloped Neil Gaiman, uh, I get the impression that, that Beacon Hill Books is the type of bookstore where five months ago, when that scandal had not yet enveloped him, if you went in and said, do you have any Neil Gaiman books, they would have taken you to them. And now, if you went in and said, do you have any Neil Gaiman books, they would scold you. It's okay. not just that they wouldn't have the books, it's that you're a bad person for asking. I could be wrong about that. I haven't actually been there. <laughs> but, uh, shall we get to a couple of my own books? Sure. Uh, I've read two books in the time that we've been having this conversation. <laughs> I read this, The Resort. Okay. Novel about a, a young woman who goes to the, a perfect white sand drugs and drink beach in Thailand. And there's a murder there. And it wasn't good. It wasn't good. It, it didn't. It didn't have the bones of a good story, but it also wasn't well executed. Lots and lots of one sentence paragraphs all told in a, a breathless kind of present tense. No, oh, I hate that. Just, I want no, to- Is it a first time author? Oh, I don't know. Or... Uh, I don't think so. No, it is. Yes, this is, a no this is her first novel. And okay. she herself is uh, incredibly young. So I guess the flaws in it are things that you know, maybe could be fixed with time, I guess. But it, she got a hardcover contract with, who is this, Sourcebooks? And she got Book of the Month Club. And I bet it's option for a screen deal of some kind. So what are the chances that anyone is ever going to tell her, look, all of this list of things is things you're doing wrong? What are the chances? She must think, at, look at this book and think, I did this exactly right. Right. With, with you know, a, a, a couple of voices here and there saying, no, 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 this is brainless fiction that you generated. And you're not so a brain. Is the, is the plot interesting? Like plot is the only it? interesting thing. If I, all, the whole time I was reading, I was thinking, God, I wish either you had bear, buckled down and written this for adults or that someone else had written this. But no, <laughs> but no. <laughs> but the other book, that I read during this conversation is a reread and it was really good. I liked it even more the second time. It's this thing, Lincoln okay. and the Power of the Press by Harold Holzer. Uh, this is a uh, his best-selling book on Lincoln. He's a great Lincoln scholar, absolutely fantastic as a Lincoln scholar. And a couple of the other books that he's written about Lincoln, I like much better than I like this book. Uh, so I went back to this and read it again and Boy, oh boy, is it good. <laughs> oh boy. It takes Holy Saint Abe and knocks him right off the pedestal. Lincoln did things with the so-called, with the not so-called, the actual constitutionally enshrined freedom of the press that <laughs> any president today who did anything like them would be vilified forever. And yet... It was wartime. He felt that he needed to, and he won. In the mm -hmm. end, he won. So he did not believe in the freedom of the press at all. He did not believe in the sanctity of the Fourth Estate at all. It's weird to see. And the, Holzer loves this guy. Holzer loves Lincoln. All of his other books on Lincoln make that clear. This book makes it clear. I think it's just amazingly well done that you can know that he likes Lincoln while he's still beating Lincoln up about all these things. Right. But he did. That's, you know, if in a, in a book where where Lincoln attacks the press nonstop, or he attacks Horace Greeley and whatnot, it, you would think in an author that just uncritically loves Lincoln that he would start to vilify the press, and Holzer never does that. So it's very, very enjoyable. It's hmm. very, very cool. I want to read more of history, more presidential history. How is Sherman's history section? Um. Yeah, kind of spotty i would say i mean it, it's it's not very big so um and i and to be honest i haven't really gone in looking for 
of the particular history book. So I, I don't know. I does don't it, know is the answer. Does it have a big staff? Um, they, they usually have at any one time, they usually ha have maybe two or three employees working um, when I go in, but I don't notice, I, I don't go that frequently because, you know, I'm not allowed out of the compound, but, but when I do go, I, I don't recognize people um, from the previous time. And I, and I don't think that that means there's turnover. I just think it's, I, I very rarely go and I don't remember who's there and who's not, you know? I imagine that your men folk don't like you reading anyway. Um, I don't think they have a problem with it because it keeps me quiet, you know? And that's, that's the important thing. As long as you're quiet. So are, you can have, you can have ideas, just don't express them. <laughs> it's straight out of project 2025. <laughs> like you said, when we started this conversation, what are women thinking? <laughs> If they're voting for this, what are they thinking? I don't know. I, I It'd can't... be one thing if we if we were talking purely in hypotheticals, if we were talk going to to MAGA women voters and saying just hypothetically these guys mean ill to you, they want you to be a second class I'm citizen. Not... But we lost Roe. It's not I hypothetical. Don't... It's real world. They lost rights that their mothers had. See, yeah. I don't think. I think they think. This, the same thing like gay Republicans think and disabled Republicans think and uh, veterans and the elderly, they think, oh, they're not going to come after me. They mean the other people. And, and, that's, um, and that's what I think that, that they must think is like, yeah, they, they don't mean that I won't have rights. Yes. They mean they mean the bad women won't have rights, or the, or it the mystifies me. It mystifies immigrant me. women won't have rights. When the, Roe what? was struck down, I was amazed. I thought, surely this means that every MAGA woman voter in the country who has a daughter is immediately going to change their voter registration. Yeah, but see, their daughters aren't going to get pregnant because <laughs> their daughters are good girls, unlike the other girls. And what about the log cabin Republicans, gay MAGA Republicans, when Obergefell is repealed, as it certainly will be in the next court session, so that gay marriage is illegal? I don't know. It, they, don't think, they don't think it's going to happen, and it's going to happen. Like... You know, you can you can have your opinions on, you know, tax and spend Democrats or whatever, but morally, like, how can you how can you support taking rights away from people, especially when you are a member of that group? So what is Maine like? Is Maine MAGA country? Um, it is. <sighs> Yes, yes, I would say so. I, I would say especially um, certain counties, the, the further north you go, the more rural counties I think probably are. But I see a lot, like in Boston, you never saw MAGA. You yeah. know, everybody I knew was, was um, liberal and, and lefty and, but, up here, you see a lot more people wandering around wearing their uh, flag shorts and their MAGA hats and their, you know, bumper stickers and, you know, shit like that. Yeah, it, it's it's way more. It I would I would say it's not totally in your face as much as some other states, like. Um, I don't see like a whole lot of lawn signs and shit like that, but, um, but yeah, and and I'm a little more careful about what I say in public. Um, 
you know, because like I wouldn't put I wouldn't put a lawn sign out or a bumper sticker on my car or something like that because it's kind of asking for trouble. So sounds like you could use a trip to the brattle. So I think I think there's I think there's definitely a stronger um, a stronger mega influence than certainly Boston. Well, we have to wrap this up so we don't get cut off in mid-sentence. We're out of time. Okay.